Um, I thought we'd start by having you maybe just say something about what led you to composition as a means of expression. You can be, you know, don't have to go into great detail, but. Um, wow, that's a good question. Um... I mean, is it related to experience as a performer, maybe, that kind of led you to that? I think I wanted to be a, you know, I took piano lessons with my mom from a very early age, as long as I can remember. I think I learned to read music before I learned to read. And I think I was 10 years old. And I, uh, maybe a little younger, and I remember I was walking from home from school one day. And... Um, it was in the spring, and I had all these melodies going through my mind. It was almost like I could see them um, in the air. You know, like I could see leaves and flowers because it was spring, and then I noticed that there were also melodies kind of sitting mm -hmm. out there in the air, and I could tune into any of them. And I think I came home and asked my mom if, if this is what other people experience, and she said, no, that's... These were melodies that didn't already exist, you know, they were kind of ones I'd never heard before. And she said that was unusual. And then I sort of thought, well, maybe there's something to it. And then I wrote my first piece. Uh, and I, for piano, it was about, I think it was eight bars long, but it had every possible dynamic marking and tempo marking and everything that you could possibly have in it. I think I still have that sheet of music somewhere. Well, that was when I was 10. And then I, I kind of in the back of my mind, and from then on, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to be a composer someday. That's what I want to do. I had a few detours, but that's pretty much been my what I've wanted to do since then. So once you got on that track, who... Who were some of your models for composition, performance? Uh, when I was little, you mean, or when? Well, when when you were, you know, we sort of decided that's where you were going. Um, well, you know, I was mostly familiar with, um, you know, the classical music that I was playing, but also, you know, I I, I went to as many concerts as I could. You know, I read everything I could, and I went through all of my parents' record collection, which was pretty extensive, but all classical music. I sort of got into popular music, um, and kind of, it took me a while, but, you know, when I was a teenager, I got really into prog rock. It sort of was the genre that really resonated for me. So I was listening to prog rock, and then... I had a few experiences in high school that uh, kind of led me to somewhat to what, you know, some of the things I do now. There was a, a uh, my elementary school and my high school were on the same block and they were across the street from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. And they had a pretty forward looking uh, music department there. And I remember... Um, one of the uh, professors there, he was a joint professor of bassoon and composition. Now I've forgotten his name. But he got some kind of grant that, that they used to get in those days to come to the high school and work on improvisation with us. And this was not jazz improvisation. He was not a jazz musician. And it was kind of like modern, classical, experimental improvisation. So that was, you know maybe ninth, 10th grade. Um, and, you know, other experiences like that. I had a violin teacher who was really into bar talk. And so we went through a lot of bar talk and, and, you know, when you study piano in Canada, you have to play, uh, you know, it's this Canadian content thing where, you know, 30% of all music has to be by Canadians. Right. Well, you don't get a lot of Canadian composers until the modern era. So, um, you know, I was exposed to this to sort of living composer music pretty early on. 
And uh, then once I got to college, well, you know, again, I was I was focusing on composing and, and a little bit. And uh, I had started doing jazz in high school a little bit, but of course we didn't have a jazz program. I was pretty ignorant about what jazz was. My dad had been sort of a, he was a jazz lover. He had very specific tastes that would have been, um, well, it was kind of reminds me of, of uh, you know, prog rock for us. It was like progressive jazz, I think is what they called it in those days, you know. Uh, you know, like Dave Brubeck and, and uh, Stan, Stan Kenton. Kenton. Yeah, he had Stan Kenton records. And, um, but, you know, I, I think I got into Thelonious Monk kind of early on in high school, and I transcribed some of these things, but nobody ever taught me, you know, jazz piano. Mm. And then I came to BYU and tried out for the jazz program and, and you know, Ray Smith or whoever, they thought I was weird, which I was. And they let me participate, but it was kind of like, I remember I was in the, the combo, this combo. It wasn't the worst combo, it was the oddball combo. And you probably know some of these people now, I've forgotten their names, but it was like people that they didn't know where to put them were in this combo. And right. and then I, it's actually interesting. It was when you and I were started hanging out um, that I sort of, you know, I was aware of like Ornette Coleman and Cecil Taylor as, as far as, you know, free jazz and avant-garde jazz, but that was about it. And then I think you turned me on to Henry Threadgill and then that kind of opened me up to the whole Chicago, you know, AACM and Anthony Braxton and, um, that was where I thought, okay, this is this is my home. This is what resonates with me because I, what I loved about jazz was not really. I <laughs> I told this to my students a few weeks ago. I said I love everything about jazz except for the way it sounds, which I I was. <laughs> that's not exactly true, but I like the. Uh, I you know I kind of thought straight ahead jazz was a little bit corny, you know, growing up, but the improvisatory aspect and the, the, the format and the flexibility of it are, are what's most uh, engaging to me about it. And once I discovered, you know, Threadgill and Braxton and those guys, you know, it, for me, it was musicians who were uh, curious and open to all genres of music and all types of sounds. They weren't obsessed with the kind of macho, you know, cutting session aspect of it and so that just really resonated for me and still does and has for a long time so a lot of the music i do is is in this medium kind of avant-garde jazz of course you've participated with me somewhat guilty yeah <laughs> um i wondered because the one one little snippet on your biography talked about your interest in modular textures and forms. And I think because the students in the class have been playing anomalous, that maybe that's a piece with that particular structural component. Can you say a little bit about what, how you define that and what it means to you? Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking about that piece and then another piece that you've played on the um, anatomy series. Wait, yeah, anatomy series. Those are two particular pieces. Um, I guess there's a lot I could say about them. And I've got several others where, um, you know, I was inspired by a lot of, there are a lot of precursors like In C by Terry Riley, um, which, you know, of course, you know, and maybe your students know about, but. We, we played it in the ensemble. Oh, one okay. of the we read the semesters. Yeah, so that was a huge influence on me. And I think this is when I was at Mills College I was in an ensemble that just really went through a lot of uh, these pieces, specifically where the performers had uh, cells or little bits of music that they could select from. Um, and there were different criteria for how to go from place to place. 
of course, you know, the other aspect that I didn't mention is I've always loved funk. You know, I've always loved James Brown and the meters. And, you know, I was thinking about it again when we lived together. I had that meters album, which was almost impossible to come by and couldn't find a way to play it or record it or get it onto a cassette. I mean, just listening to meters was a, a big chore in those days. But it was because of that that sound that the, the interlocking grooves were so beguiling to me. So, you know, in writing Anomalous, um, I thought, well, what if you could create a, a, a funk groove that evolves and that can be shaped by the members of the ensemble? Um, it's like a funk version of NC. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Now, NC, you have to go in one direction, right? You have to go. Right. And that that's not what most of my modular things you can move around. You know, they're improvised, basically. So they're a little more, yeah, jazzy, I guess, in terms of being able to improvise and individuals expressing themselves, you know. Um, and um, I mean, the thing about the Terry Riley piece and others like it is it's the open instrumentation concept which, you know, that's the great uh, weakness of classical music is, is you have to have the right instruments for, to play a particular piece. And that's a real problem. If, especially if you're directing a new music ensemble at a college, you know, if you end up with a tuba and a piccolo and a glockenspiel and an electric guitar, or like a baritone guitar or something, I'm just imagining the most extreme. Yeah. What do you do? Well, you named uh, part of our ensemble already. Yeah. <laughs> the particular problem that we encountered. Yeah. And that's one reason Anomalous seemed like a, a good fit for the the resources we were dealing with. Um, okay, so maybe then the other thing I was interested in was your sense of the authority of the performers in that piece, I guess, particularly, but maybe more generally. How much authority do they have to shape the structure? Um, in your vision of it, at least. A lot. As, I mean, I guess this is where it's, it's a little bit more in the jazz realm that the, these modular pieces I view as resources. You know, it's kind of like, um, you know, instead of having you know, a piece and a score being synonymous, which is sort of the way classical music is. This is more like a resource that you can use to make a piece, to make a performance. And I have instructions, but they're pretty open. You know, I mean, the duration is complete of, of the entire piece or of each individual section is completely up to the performers. You, I do envision um having um a leader you know it doesn't have to be that way but i i'm trying to remember were you at all the the premieres that we did at anomalous records oh yeah I'm, yeah well, i know i was for there for all of them <laughs> yeah and i i had a fender Rhodes at that time i wish i'd kept that for heaven's sake but yeah. <laughs> I was sort of directing from the roads and, and which was good because I could play all the lines on it. So it was kind of like if I wanted to beef up one part of the texture, I could play it. And so, um, yeah. And, and the fun thing there is I, I think of the people that were playing, you know, Craig Flory and Avon King and and just kind of, kind of everybody showed up and um, they were all good at, at listening and then you know, improvising. It was kind of like, you know, kind of like free improvisation, but but limited by the the selections, you know. And then I would indicate, okay, now we're in this uh, part where you can change the pitches but use the same rhythms, and then we'd go into the part where it was completely free improvisation. So, yeah, it's really up to the performers. Yeah, the... I made this. This is oh, a, yeah. <laughs> That's from a Vashon Island ferry. But I sort of made these a little more shorthand because the ones you had were just like that. Oh, that's great. 
So there's there's smaller ones. That one that was blank. It can't be useful. Improvise and yeah, <laughs> notes and all that. So you know, and I I've been conducting and try, just trying to figure out how to shape it in ways that a big that fit your vision of it, but knowing that you're not you know, doctrinaire or dogmatic about what it is in the end, you're, you're more willing to let the piece be constructed by the people who are playing it than realized in some fashion that you desire. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully it could be better than I imagined, you know? I mean, that's right. one thing, again, I'm not trying to get too personal, but I when I lived in Seattle and played with you all the time, I got used to leaving things open for you because I knew you could come up with a part that was better than what I could come up with. And so that's that's the hope, you know. That's very different from writing conventional classical music where you do have a, a so, well, some of us sometimes, you know, you have a, a idea of how you want things to sound. I mean, this is, I guess there is an idea of how I want it to sound, but uh, it's very flexible, you know. I mean... There was that uh, Swiss ensemble that, that did a performance of this piece. I don't know if you heard any of that. Yeah, I think I gave the students a link to that. So some of them have checked it out, I'm sure. Well, it's very interesting because it sounds completely different from our the version that we did. Because there's the, you know, they don't have that American downward, you know, funk rock. It's, right. you know, it's more up oriented. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. Even though they've got percussion, bass, guitar, you know, electric guitar, saxophone, they've got these instruments, but the, the, there's such a, you know, a, a Western European classical kind of vibe to it. And I don't mind it at all. I mean, it, it's just different, you know. I, I, right. I was, when I first heard it, I, was, I laughed, but then I was kind of delighted by it, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's so interesting to me that it, it has that kind of flexibility because I know that you have written fully notated music. Sure. And I've played a lot of that kind of music, and I certainly l love a lot of that tradition. But as somebody who's, you know, played jazz and improvised for a long time, it, it was a, what I enjoyed about that piece in particular was its way of combining those universes and the the cage you know the mid late 20th century earlier 21st century notions about music making grabbing things from everywhere and letting those be part of what you do even though the piece still has its specific name it's all of that stuff rather than being a document from an earlier time yeah yeah that um yeah <laughs> it, it's funny talking about it now because you know that one and the anatomy series i wrote pretty quickly but all this stuff was coming together i mean it was this very heady time in seattle when there were so many people just very excited about making music and and you know i'm sure it's still like that um and I, I was very, uh, you know, I wasn't thinking, well, I was thinking a little bit, but it was more like just doing, you know. And like the cue cards, those are straight from Zorn's Cobra, you know. Right. And the piece doesn't sound anything like Zorn, but, but that idea of a leader having cue cards was so uh, efficient and interesting to me. And, and the thing is, you know, this is the case with a lot of my music is... Um, it's kind of liminal, you know, I, I I hear something and I think, oh, that's cool, but I want it a little bit more like this other thing. And, you know, there's a lot of boundaries. It's like, well, you can't combine this and that. And it's like, well, that's exactly what I want to do. And so it's like, uh, again, a lot of these uh, sort of indeterminate pieces that I played when I was at Mills, I liked them. But the thing that, that was unsatisfying was the rhythm, you know, like it's, well, I'd like a piece that has a beat to it, you know? Right, And right. then I think of like James Brown and the Meters or even 
some, oh, I don't know, experimental music that has a beat like uh, uh, Glenn Branca or something like that. And it's like, okay, that's cool, but it doesn't, I want it to have everything. You know what I mean? Right. I, I want there to be some forward motion. I don't want it to just stay the same thing, you know, like minimalist for a long time. But then again, I don't want it, I want it to have a beat. You know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. I mean, I, you know, maybe we've talked about this in the past, but the Art Ensemble Chicago was always an interesting model for me because they could be playing a free, quiet improvisation one moment, and then suddenly they're playing a Bob Marley tune that has a real <laughs> deep groove. Yeah. And then they're playing like a free jazz kind of boppish you know, head, and then five minutes later, they're they're doing an African drumming kind of uh, structure. Yeah. So it's a, that that's a very modular, I guess, related to your notion of modular yeah. stuff in a different way. Um, all right. Well, I think that's that's a pretty good okay. place to, to end. So thank you for uh, willing being willing to you know, be a model for, for the class, for, for our ensemble and submit to a grilling, uh, <laughs> My pleasure. under, under duress. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> you have trouble, man. So, uh, thanks again for, for being with us. Okay. I'll talk, all right. to, you soon. talk to you later. See you. Bye. Okay. Bye.